Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so we're going to get started and continue right where we left off last time. I had asked you uh, in the handout from prior class to look at plotting some of the constraints on a two set of axes. And what I've provided you in the, so in the handout from today is the solution to what that plot should look like. And uh, we can take a look back at our problem. Uh, we had several constraints. And so what I've written up here is the problem back up in, in the form that we ended off with in the prior class. We've got, we had several constraints and what these constraints essentially do is they define what we call a feasible region. And so each one of these boundaries here on this diagram represents one of those constraints. Let's take a look at 0.3x1 plus 0.4x2 greater than 2. That was uh, your gasoline constraint and 0.3x1 plus 0.4x2 greater than 2, you can find the equation of that line. That's straightforward. We don't need to do that. And recognize then that the constraint requires that if we're feasible, we're on this side of the line. So that would be the direction of greater than 2. If we're on this side of the line, that's the opposite of the constraint. The second constraint is due to uh, jet fuel. Uh, created 0.4x1 plus 0.2x2 that creates this more steeper line okay so you just rearrange this equation you've got an x1 and an x2 rearrange it in the standard form y equals mx plus c and you can draw that line um, and then again that region over there up and to the right is the feasible region the region off here below to the left is infeasible the third constraint, 0.2x1 plus 0.3x2, is in fact over here. And it simply says that you have to operate this side of the line. Okay, So that constraint, actually, this is the advantage of the graphical drawing, is that you see that that constraint is redundant. If you meet the other two constraints, you don't really need this third constraint. Okay, we're going to see this come up in optimization software. Because in optimization software, we're going to deal with problems more than two variables, where we can't draw these diagrams. And so we'd sometimes want to know which constraints are, are not used. And that we'll, we'll see how that happens. Okay? So the 2D plot gives you a great visual view of your problem. There's some other bounds. Our non-negativity, x1, must be greater than 0. So everything above this line must be feasible. So that, in fact, clamps us down here at x1. And x2 greater than 0 lies over to that direction. We've also got two availability constraints. Recall uh, these availabilities tell us how much um, Saudi crude and Venezuelan crude. So this was Saudi for X1 and Venezuela for X2 is available to us to purchase. So X1 must be less than 9 is the vertical line and X2 less than 6 is, the hor is that horizontal line. Okay. So we won't normally plot things graphically when we solve large problems. Here, this works really well. And why it works really well is we can actually quickly see what we call our feasible region, the region that's shaded. Okay? So in your handout, I had asked you to shade the infeasible region, the region outside. The reason why I asked you to do that in your handout to, fa to shade outside the region is because we were going to draw stuff in here. Okay? But in textbooks and, and otherwise, you sometimes see that they shade the feasible region. It doesn't matter, as long as you shade one and not the other. Um, so in this solution, we've shaded what we call the feasible region. And we can now quickly then start to find where our optimum lies. Well, how do we find where our optimum lies? To do that, we need to superimpose this equation on top of the feasible region. And that's what's been done here with the dashed lines. So 20x1 plus 15x2. Okay, So these dashed lines are lines that are parallel to each other. They have to be parallel to each other. It's a linear system. 20x1 plus 15x2. It simply defines that slope for us. And you can solve that equation at any particular point. Arbitrarily, let's just pick this point here at 9 and 0. Okay, so at x1, x2 equal to 9 and 0, you can sub into that equation. 20 times 9 is 180 plus 0. You're going to get 180. And that's why you see this dashed line with 180 written there through it, indicating that that's the objective function 
at all points along this dashed diagonal have the same value of the objective function of 180. Okay, is that clear? No? Yes? Okay, so if that's, you can start your objective function arbitrarily at any point and get that line, then you can move to another point. But we know that these lines will be parallel to each other, right? That's the, the, the very definition of a linear system. Okay, and so if these lines are parallel to each other, and we know that this line passes through 180, we can figure out that going in this direction increases the objective function, right? We can see that quite clearly. If x1 goes up or x2 goes up, that value of the objective function must go up. So we know that we don't want to go to higher and higher x1s and x2s. We want to go to lower and lower x1s and x2s. So we want to head parallel, and we hit our optimum right there at that corner. Okay, so this is a graphical solution to the optimization problem. That dashed, those dashed lines represent the cost. Okay? So a cost value of 180, <coughs> remember in this problem we worked in scale thousands, and the units of x1 and x2 were barrels per day. The units of these coefficients were dollars per barrel. So the objective function, that actually implies $180,000 per day. Okay? So that would be the meaning of the 180. All points along this line have an objective cost of $180,000 per day. So any combination of x1 and x2 along that line would have that objective function value. Our optimum, you can sub in x1 equals 2 and x2 equals 3.5 and, and calculate the objective function. So around $92,000 per day. Now here's what's interesting about the graphical method that you don't get from algebraic systems or from computer software. Right, you can start to answer some interesting questions. For example, if, remember this problem was based in Texas, right? so if the United States government put an embargo on oil from Saudi Arabia, could you still meet your production requirements? So you cannot buy oil from Saudi Arabia, can you still meet your production requirements? Take a look at that graph and answer. Yes, no? No. Okay. If you cannot buy from Saudi Arabia, the English version of, or the mathematical version of that is x1 is 0. Sorry. So x1 is 0, you're along this line. And there's no way that you could be in the feasible region. If the United States government said you can't buy oil from Venezuela, okay, they don't like Hugo Chavez anymore historically, then x2 is now 0. And when x2 is 0, you're somewhere along here. Can you meet your production requirements? <coughs> yes. yes. Somewhere You'd have to just buy somewhere between this amount and that amount of Saudi oil. And obviously now your minimum then shifts to that corner. Okay. So this is the advantage of the graphical method. You can sort of ask these what if questions. You can also do it mathematically, right? If the United States government puts in a constraint like that, <coughs> You just recode your constraints, go back to GAMS, hit solve, and find the new solution with that new constraint. Okay, but the, the graphical method gives you a bit of quick insight into that as well. How many degrees of freedom do we have? We spoke about degrees of freedom last week. Intuitively, one, two, zero, do we have zero degrees of freedom? No, okay. Zero degrees of freedom says you can't adjust anything. The whole system is fixed. Well, we know that's not true. You can adjust two things. Either x1 and x2 can be adjusted. Okay, so you've got two degrees of freedom. You can move around in the space by adjusting any two variables, x1, x2. So later on, when we do our mathematical analysis, we must see or we expect to get two degrees of freedom. We'll look at that on Wednesday. Okay. Everything clear on this, um, this visual plot? Yeah, Niall? I thought it was one degree 
which is the one equation. Okay. This is not an equation. We're, this is an objective that we're trying to solve outside the system. We want to just minimize that. Okay. So I'm, I, I'm not going to show you the equations just yet. We will, by the end of this class, you might be able to reformulate and find the equations. I'll show you how. Okay. But we have two degrees of freedom in the meaning of you can adjust any two things independently to minimize your cost. You can adjust either your Saudi purchase or your Venezuela purchase or both to achieve a minimum here. Okay. Is there a unique optimum? Yeah, okay. Would it be possible to get an infinite number of optimums that are equally this equally valid? How? Get one of the slopes to be the same as the slope of the optimum. Okay. One of the constraints to be the same. So Mahir is saying if, if one of these constraints over here had the same slope as your objective function, you're going to land up against a parallel line. And then any point along that parallel line would have the same objective function value, meaning any of them is equally as optimal as any of the other. Okay? So that, that sometimes happens in linear programming problems. You pick an objective function that happens to be parallel to one of your constraints, and you land up at a boundary rather than at a corner. Okay, so let's introduce some terminology then related to that. Okay, so we're going to introduce about five or six new concepts next and then, um, then go from there. Okay, so a boundary, the definition of a boundary is an edge or a corner on the feasible region. Okay, so a boundary very specifically is any one of those lines on the feasible region, or a corner, right? A corner is also on a line, by definition. A corner is on the line, and so that introduces the next idea of what we will call more technically an extreme point. Okay, so an extreme point is a point on the boundary at the corner. And you might want to cross-reference a few of these in your notes, just uh, for you to go check afterwards. For example, a boundary point in this problem, if you look back at your figure, a boundary point could be the 9 and 4. Right. Check your diagram. Is 9 and 4 on the boundary? x1 equal to 9. x2 equals to 4. That's on your boundary. Okay, 7 and 6 would be another example of that. Okay, an extreme point in this particular problem would be a point on the boundary at the corner for example, 9 and 0 would be an extreme point, or 1 and 6. Those two are examples of extreme points. So cross-reference back to your diagram to see that. Yes, Mark? Would your optimum still be considered an extreme point? We're going to look at that next, yeah. It's coming up. Yes, Nehemiah? We have five extreme points in this example. Yeah, that could be another. We have five extreme points. 
Okay, well, let's introduce another concept, an interior point is a point inside the feasible region. Okay, and an exterior point is outside the feasible region. And I'll give some examples of those, but that's pretty self-explanatory. An, an interior point, for example, would be 7, 5, and 5 and 4. Okay, they're in that shaded region, the feasible region. And an exterior point could be, for example, uh, 2 and 1, or um, 10 and 7. So those are examples of infeasible points or exterior points. Okay. So an exterior point, uh, infeasible point would be saying the same thing. Okay, and there's this theorem. We, we're not big on proofs, as you know, in engineering, um, and myself particularly don't like to spend class time on showing theorems, but there's a theorem that can show every optimum to a well-posed linear programming problem is where? Every optimum to a linear programming problem will lie Interior, extreme, extreme, or boundary? boundary? All three. Will an optimum lie in the interior? Okay, if you're at an interior point and you move just a little bit, you can always move in a direction that will make that optimum go in a better direction. So interior points will never be an optimum solution. Okay, so in extreme optimal solutions to a well-posed LP are either at the boundary or at an extreme point. So they're at the boundary points, plural, or an extreme point, singular. Yeah, so you can write that a little bit more explicitly, that should you happen to land up on a boundary, you can either move over to one edge or to the other edge, to one corner or the other corner, and simply give the extreme point, okay? So we'll clarify that a little bit, and he was pointing out an interesting feature. Boundary points, of course, you get multiple points with the same objective, but we can say a unique solution or a unique optimum will lie at an extreme point. Yes, Mark? Sorry, what's LP? Linear, prob linear programming problem, or linear optimization problem. OK, another way of saying that is if a boundary point is optimum, then so will be one of the extreme points on that boundary. 
Okay, so if you look at the diagram that you have in front of you, you've got five extreme points. If you were coding this up, like GAMS would, one strategy you might use to find your optimum is to start at one of the extreme points and simply bounce around through all the extreme points because this theorem says we know that we're going to find an optimum at an extreme point. In fact, you can disregard everything in that problem. You can only focus on the extreme points, evaluate your objective function at the extremes, and pick the one that gives you the lowest value. And you're done. Okay, that, that would not be an efficient way to code it up, because when you deal with multiple variables, visiting every single extreme is not feasible. I should, let's not use that word. It's not um, <coughs> Tractable is the nice mathematical way of saying it. So visiting every single combination of extremes is not a tractable mathematical or computer software implementation. Right? But we have this theorem, and for small problems, you can absolutely go do this. Simply go visit every extreme and find the one that gives you the lowest objective function value. OK, so I am going to prove this theorem to you in a very crude way. And it's not my invention. This is Dr. Marlin's invention. So he calls this the LP machine, TM Tom Marlin. OK, so here's an objective function. And here's three constraints, linear constraints. This surface is my objective function. And I'm going to minimize. I'm going to minimize because I'm going to use gravity. OK, this ball will always land at a corner. Okay? It will land here. If, if my objective function is this plane here is my objective function, and I want to minimize, it will land in this corner. It will land in this corner or that corner, depending on the orientation of my system. Right? If this constraint happens to be parallel with the ground, I can land in this corner, anywhere along this horizontal surface, or in that corner. But this system proves to you in a very crude way that any LP will always have its optimum at an extreme point. Okay? It's a linear objective function. So a linear objective always just keeps heading down. right? We know that as long as we keep going, we're going to encounter a minimum somewhere. And that minimum must be at an extreme point. Okay, so, so that's an important theorem from linear programming. Yes? Uh, did you say that all extreme points are boundary points? All extreme points are also boundary points. And are all boundary points extreme points? No. Okay. Are all boundary points extreme points? That's an extreme point. That black line represents a sequence of boundary points, two of which are extremes. Okay. So every extreme point is also a boundary point. But boundary points are not extreme. They're just <coughs> mathematical logic there. Anything unclear about that new terminology? Okay, we're going to use this over and over, so let's clarify any issues. OK, nothing? Let's move on then. So if we look back at your diagram, and if we consider that this new idea that every optimum is going to be at an extreme point. If you look at that extreme point, there's certain constraints active at that extreme point. Let me uh, perhaps turn this projector on again and illustrate that to you. OK, so back to this diagram, which is coming up. Let's imagine you're at this point over here, one, 1 and 6. So x1 equals 1, x2 equals 6. There's two constraints active at that particular point. The constraints which are active are x2 less than equals 6, and this diagonal constraint, 0.4x1 plus 0.2x2 greater than 1.5. Okay. So at that point, two constraints are active. At this point, how many constraints are active? Two constraints, these two. 
And notice that these two points over here are what we would call adjacent points. Adjacent points always have <coughs> one of, uh, have the same number of constraints that are active ex except one of them. Okay, this is some minor detail. But every time we move from one extreme to the next, we drop off an active constraint and we bring a new one in at the very least. So every single one of these corner points has two active constraints. So that's a new terminology there. Active constraints and all the others we say are inactive. So maybe let's just uh, note that here. You can have, yeah. Yeah, it's just in, in coincidence in this one that there's two active. Okay, so a point that might be an optimum. Okay, so you're essentially where I'm going with this. We're considering a particular extreme point. We are considering an extreme point to be an optimum. So a point that might be an optimum has some constraints that define that point. Okay, so for example, if we look at the point x1, x2 equals to uh, 1 and 6, the two constraints which are active at that point are x2 and I'm going to write this in this way. x2 is equal to 6, and 0.4x1 plus 0.3x2 is equal to 1.5. Okay. Right at the point where those two cross, let's bring this back down again, sorry. The intersection of those two equations, these are not inequalities anymore, these are equations, equalities, is defined where those two lines intersect. You can solve two equations in two unknowns, it's trivial in this example, and calculate x1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to 6, would be a solution to two equations in two unknowns. Okay, other constraints are deemed inactive. OK, so when computer software solves these linear programming problems, all it does in many, many dimensions, here we're just in two dimensions, but in standard problems, there's hundreds of thousands of variables. It's not uncommon to have very, very large LPs. All it's doing is it's moving around from extreme point to extreme point. How do you know a, a point is an extreme point? Well, an extreme point is where more than one of your equality constraints are active. So you can rewrite at an extreme point more than one of those equations to be in their equality form. Okay? And then we can go move around from one extreme to the next to find the one that gives us the, the optimum. Okay? Now that sounds trivial to say that in English, but just even the idea of how do you start off, right? Remember when a computer program starts off, it doesn't have a picture like this in its mind. A computer, how will it just even find an initial point that it knows is on the boundary? But that's a hard problem. Just simply finding your starting point. The next step is Let's say, for example, in a computer, you were at this, let's say you'd started and you happen to select that point as your starting point. How does the computer know to go down here, here, and here? Or should it rather go this way and this way? Right, so how does a computer step from one point to the next? So those, it's non-trivial to simply say, go visit points and find the one that's best. How, do you, how would you do that in practice is, um, what really sets various 
optimizes a part. And there isn't one linear programming algorithm. There's multiple out there. And so we will look at one classic one called the simplex method. And we'll understand it, how it moves from one point to the next to go achieve the objective. Okay? And we're not doing this arbitrarily. We're using the simplex method because when the simplex method terminates and gives you the output, it uses all sorts of language and technical details that we need to interpret. So to interpret the output from the software, we need to understand what the software is doing. Right? So I'm not teaching this for no reason. We have to understand what's going on internally here so that we can use the software output. Okay, so the first thing that the software does internally is it rewrites that linear programming problem in what's called standard form. So let's uh, understand what standard form is first. Okay, so standard form is written as minimize C transpose X. Well, let's, uh, let's expand that a little bit. That would say C1 times X1 plus C2 times X2 for as many terms as we need plus CJ times XJ up to CN XN. So it says take a coefficient multiplied by x1 plus another coefficient multiplied by x2. Keep going and notice that every x, every one of your search variables only appears once in the objective. Okay, and so our search variables then is that vector x. x1, x2, x3. These are the things we're going to adjust. And we're saying there's lowercase n search variables. So maybe if you want to write it here, n is equal to your number of search variables. And this is a little bit counterintuitive. Our constraints are going to be written as equalities. We're going to write this in matrix form, ax equals b. And all the good stuff about determinants, linear independence, and so forth that you learned in your matrix algebra course is going to start playing a role here. AX equals B. Well, how big is A and how big is B? A is M rows and N columns. B is going to be, this is going to be consistent, M by 1. And x, of course, is a vector with n entries, n times 1. And so there's n x, x's vector x is n by 1. And m here is going to be your number of equations. So m equations, n unknowns. We learned about that right back in the first week when we looked at degrees of freedom. Yes, Mark? What is ST again? Subject to. So ST subject to. So we're going to write this actually, this is the, the interesting part. We're writing this not as inequalities, but we're writing this in equality form. Why equalities? Well, remember when I showed the idea of active constraints? Active constraints are where lines cross over and they meet, and they meet when they're equal to each other. Okay, so they don't meet at greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. Active points are described when things are equal to each other. So it makes sense to deal with equalities. 
So we, all, all that linear programming is, is solving a matrix equation, AX equals B, which we've done before. We're going to just do it um, in the context of objective minimization. There's one final constraint. Our X's must be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So X is a vector, B is a vector, C is a vector, if you want to emphasize it that way. Is this for our specific example? This is in general. This is the general standard form. Yeah. OK, so let's just uh, write out here some characteristics. of standard form. So we're going to spend some time rewriting our problem in standard form. How do we know that we finished and got everything in the right order, uh, in the right form? Um, well, we've got only equality constraints. Okay, That's clear from that format over there. We only have non-negative search variables. That's another characteristic of standard form. The variables only appear once on the left hand side. The constraints Oh, sorry, there's only constants in B on the right-hand side. And then the final one, and some books enforce this, others don't. Um, the last one is that entries in B are all positive. Okay, so this is a, seems a little bit overwhelming. How do we get our problem into this format? Well, let's take a look back at some examples. So this example is going to introduce theory as well. It's not just a straightforward example. So I'm going to uh, write here before and after. So when we start with, when we convert our English statement over to mathematics, we might end up with these two equations. 0.3x1 plus 0.4x2 is greater than 2. That might be one constraint that you write out mathematically given your system. Another one, for example, might be that you've got 0.4x1 plus 0.2x2 is less than or equal to 40. And non-negativity of x1 and x2 greater than 0. So let's say that was your system that you were dealing with. The rules that we will use is the idea of slack variables. So I'm going to continue this example below here in a minute, but I just want to write out off here to the side what slack variables are. Okay. Slack variables are a way that we go from inequalities to equalities that we're looking for. And it's two very simple rules, very, very basic. Slack variables obey the following idea, is the slacks for equations which are less than or equal to B subscript I. So some constant, they're added by addition. 
okay, and slacks for inequalities that are specified as greater than or equal to bi. They're added by subtraction. So that seems a little bit confusing. Let me um, illustrate what I mean by that. So if you follow those rules, slack variables get added to your system as follows. So let's take the first one, 0.3x1 plus 0.4x2. A slack variable for the case where you've got a greater than or equal to inequality, you add a new variable by subtraction. What do I mean by that? You go and say minus x3 and you replace your inequality with an equality equals 2. Okay, this seems a little bit like magic. I'm going to explain though that we've not really done anything here. But this is what goes on to do, to get it in standard form. Once we get it in standard form, then we can go apply algorithms quite straightforwardly. But to get all LPs in a way that we can work with them, we must move to standard form. The next, let's just work on the second constraint. Do you want to take a minute and do that yourself? So to make it an equality, because it's a less than or equal to constraint, we do it by addition, so we add plus x4. So this is the other key thing. You add a new slack variable for every equation. Okay, so let's expand our rules here. Slacks are added by addition, they're added by subtraction, and the third point is that there's a new slack for every inequality. Yes. So X3 and X4, they have to be yeah. We're going to add that in. We're not quite finished yet with this example. The last entry in the example is to say then X1, X2, X3, X4 are greater than or equal to zero. Yes, Mark. Why does it so it says only equality constraints for characteristics of standard form? These are, this is my set of non-negativity. Yeah. These are, this last set is your non-negativity. Okay. So before we had two variables, after we finished, we've now got four variables. And you're like, whoa, this is, you're making this thing bigger, a bigger problem than it really needs to be. Okay, let me show you that we've not really done so by just focusing, I'll just focus on this particular um, equation, the one that I've underlined there. It's not really such a big deal because do the following to yourself or show the, prove the following to yourself. We've got that inequality that x3 must be greater than zero, right? That's, that's there. Well, what's x3? x3 is equal to OK, let's sub that in. x3 says 2 minus 0.3 x1 minus 0.4 Okay, x3 is 2 minus, did I do this right? X3 is equal to, oh shoot, yeah, 
So x3 is equal to minus 2 plus 0.3x1 plus 0.4x2. So if we sub in, then x3 is minus 0.2 plus 0.3x1 plus 0.4x2 greater than or equal to 0. Right? Yes? No? Confused faces? Is this x1, x2, x3, or that's before, and now we're adding sign variables? I'm showing that what we've done here has not really changed the problem. OK, so I'm taking what we've got ended up with. We've not really changed the problem significantly. We've looked at like we're adding two more variables, but we're just rewriting the problem in a different way. So basically what you're saying is the slack variable represents the buffering that you can do between the That's why it's called a slack, yeah. I'm getting to that, yeah, good. OK, so point, if we take this last equation, we can rewrite it then as 0.3x1 plus 0.4x2 greater than or equal to 2. Right? And no surprise, that's back to where we started off with. Okay, So we can always go back to where we started. Okay, so we can always undo our slack variable. Yes, Brandon? Yeah, you wouldn't go convert an equality constraint with slack variables because an equality constraint can already be written in the form ax equals b. Okay, so the o equality constraints are given by ax equals b. So what we've done is we've converted our inequality to an equality so that we can write it in the form ax equals b. Okay. So what would be the A matrix for this system of equations that we've ended up with in blue? So what would the A matrix, remember we want to write it as AX equals B, what would the A matrix and the B vector look like for that system in blue? How many rows? So A is M by N. M was, M was the number of equations, and N was your number of variables. In blue, how many equations do we have? How many variables? OK, so write out two rows and four columns that make up your A matrix. OK, so A is an M by N matrix, two rows, four columns. The first row? 0 0.3. 0 0.3. 0 0.4, negative 0 0.4, negative 0 0.4, negative 0 0.4, minus 1, 0. Second row, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0, 1. OK, what's the B vector? 2 and 40. OK, so B. So we've gone and converted our system from having inequalities to a system of only equalities, AX equals B. We've got non-negative search variables. Variables only appear once on the left-hand side. X1 appears once on the left-hand side, X2, X3, X4. They only appear once per equation on the left-hand side. But if you, X1 appeared more than once on the, on the left-hand side, you just sum up the coefficients, right? And 
accumulate in that way. The constants B on the right hand side are positive. And those are the last two there. So entries on B are on the right hand side. Entries in the B vector are all positive. OK. So let me uh, leave you. How much time do we have? We're over time. OK. So next class, we'll do two or three more examples at the beginning. And then we'll move on to some more theory then.